What can you tell on national television on 60 Minutes right now? What can you tell the American people about the integrity of the 2020 presidential election in the state of Georgia? I would tell everyone that Georgia has a verifiable paper ballot, which means that when you rescan the ballots and when you do a hand recount, it did two things. It verified the count, but it also then verified the accuracy of the machines so that our machines did not flip votes. Then we also had a, a new online absentee ballot portal, which was photo ID, and over 70% of the people that used it on the runoff election used that form, and so that was secure. We never got rid of signature match. We actually did double signature match. When you applied for your absentee ballot, you had to sign your name, and we matched that signature. We verified it. Then when we sent you the ballot, when the county sent you the ballot and, they, and you sent it back on the outside of your envelope, we verified that signature. So your signature was matched twice. We had safe, secure, honest elections. That was our old pal, Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, repeating the big lie that America's elections in 2020 were the most secure in history. Yet as you've seen throughout this program, Raffensperger's claims are simply untrue. And now a Georgia court is adjudicating claims that the electronic voting machines themselves are easy to hack. Our elections in 2020 were not safe or fair, least of all in Georgia, whether it be the possibility of corrupted voting machines or the very easy to see ballot stuffing schemes orchestrated by the Democrats and their allies. The 2020 election was a purposeful disaster by design under the guise of making everyone safe from COVID. Election authorities in the run-up to the 2020 election changed the way that America conducts its sacrosanct elections. It reduced the need for voter verification, excuse me, voter identification verification, and encouraged widespread ballot fraud, which the Democrats, who were desperate to oust the orange van from the White House, were more than happy to exploit. And now we have the proof that the fix was in. A mind-boggling survey, survey was conducted by the Heartland Institute and Rasmussen, which determined that a shocking one in five voters admitted to committing voter fraud in 2020. I say it's mind-boggling because I can't figure out what's scarier, that so many Americans gleefully held the Democrats to rig the 2020 election or that so many of them happily admitted to it. More unnerving is the thought that there are probably many more people who committed voter fraud but simply refused to admit it to inquiring pollsters. As you can see from the analysis that Rasmussen did of the results of their joint poll, 21% of likely U.S. voters who voted by absentee or mail-in ballot admitted to having filled out ballots for people other than themselves. Moreover, and this is especially important in those hotly contested states in 2020, such as Georgia and Arizona, at least 17% of all mail-in voters copped to casting ballots in states where they were no longer a permanent resident. Justin Harris, the director of the Socialism Research Center at the Heartland Institute, correctly described the results of the poll as stunning. Furthermore, the results of the Rasmussen poll proves that, despite all the claims from our elite media and political officials, the 2020 election was a shambolic, corrupt affair that likely resulted in a false win for Joe Biden and a Trump's wrongful removal from office. With us now is Christopher Talgo. He is an editorial director and socialism research fellow at the Heartland Institute. Christopher is here with us to share more insights and to that disturbing report that his organization did in conjunction with Rasmussen Reports on how corrupt the 2020 election was. Chris, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know what, it's kind of shocking, I, I guess, a big revelation of this study is, and I think it's disheartening, is how lightly so many people take our elections, which are really sacred to the heart of a constitutional republic. Yeah, so what what we found in our initial uh, poll was that at least one in five voters admitted to committing one type of election fraud. And that's uh, an important distinction to make because they could have... Um, committed multiple forms of election fraud. So that that one in five number was our was our low baseline. After we uh, looked into the raw data supplied by Rasmussen, we actually uh, came up with a new number. It's at 28 percent. So 28 percent of those who voted by mail in 2020 admitted to us that they committed one, at least one type of uh, mail and voter fraud. So what we did then was we, we asked ourselves, 
you know, the election in the six swing states was uh, very, very, very close. We're talking less than 20,000 votes per swing state. So we took the data that uh, Rasmussen supplied us and then we applied it to the uh, the mail-in uh, voter data that these states, you know, have on record. And we we just extrapolated the, the numbers and said, well, you know, if 28%, you know, committed uh, election fraud, what would that have translated in terms of the mail-in uh, vote in, the, in those states? It's very important to remember that in those states, uh, Biden, and Bart- Biden uh, had almost double, twice the size of the mail-in vote that Trump did. So when you extrapolate the data and say, well, if if uh, some of those were, you know, those mail-in bo- uh, votes should have been discarded because they were illegally cast, we uh, show that in multiple scenarios, Donald Trump would have won the swing states and would have won the Electoral College. The paper goes into, uh, you know, intricate detail here. But what I want the uh, listeners to understand is even if we said that uh, the the mail uh, the fraud rate was the same on both sides, Trump still wins. And then even if we say that the, that the mail-in uh, voter fraud levels were much lower than the Rasmussen uh, poll says, he still wins. So under a variety of scenarios, Trump would have won the 2020 election had mail-in voting fraud been prevented from occurring. And, and, and this is simply looking at the mail-in Mellon voting fraud. We're not even getting to some of the other issues that surrounded the 2020 election. So Mm -hmm. I I guess that is also another aspect of this that is extremely shocking because you're looking at just one one facet of a lot of problems in the 2020 election, whether it be, you know, change in rules, extended dates, all this. And just looking at the Mellon ballots, did that surprise you? We were surprised. We thought that the uh, the number was going to be in the 10 percent range. And when it came back at, you know, our initial uh, number was one in five. And then upon further analysis, it was actually 28 percent. We still think that that is a, a lower number. Uh, keep in mind that we asked the, the, the poll questions in late 2023. That's about three years after the election occurred. We waited, a, you know, a long time because we thought that people would be uh, more prone to be honest, you know, that far out as opposed if we had done it, you know, in a month couple months after the election so the the, these this is self-admitted uh we 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 have no reason to believe that they're lying about this and you know common sense says that it was probably a little bit higher and what does this really say about uh CISA itself knew that there was no need for mail-in ballots, the increase in mail-in ballot due to the COVID pandemic, that it wasn't going to cause widespread uh, illness or or put anyone in danger. And yet they continue to allow this narrative that there had to be mail-in, mail, massive mail-in um, voting. And, and, and in fact, we now know, um, based on a, a lot of reports, and we actually talked about one earlier today, that they that they censored anyone, even in the lead up, and I was one of those people, they censored in the lead up to the 2020 election, and it was certainly, most certainly afterward, that questioned how bad the mail-in ballots were to the outcome. This is pretty damning for the government agency that says this is the most, it was the most secure and safe election in history, and continues, continues to have their hands all in our elections. In the introduction, we go into uh, great detail as to how many uh, media officials and you know government officials uh, just kept you know scolding us that this was the most safe and secure election. And if you you know, if you question it, you're an election denier. You're wacky. You have you know no standing whatsoever. That is just simply not true. And we actually go and. Uh, spent a lot of time digging up reports uh, from the early 2000s all the way up to 2020, in which the New York Times, the Federal Election Commission, and many other sources said mail-in voting is really, really prone to to be fraudulent. We should really uh, discourage that as much as possible. But, uh, you know, Emerald, another really important thing is that in the lead up to the 2020 election, as we showed in, in the paper, every single swing state Every single swing state went out of their way to unconstitutionally change their voting rules. This is supposed to be only done at the state legislature level. However, secretaries of state and others in these states went out of their way to make it so much easier to commit voter fraud by mail. And it's also important to understand that they um, mass mailed these ballots based on notoriously inaccurate and outdated voter rolls. 
voter rolls, as we've shown, are not cleansed annually, which they should be. And that means that a flood of ballots, we're talking tens of millions across the nation, went to people who no longer lived that residence. And when whoever happened to live at that residence at that time could have so easily cast a vote on behalf of that person, dropped into a ballot uh, drop box or whatever, and then that vote was cast and counted. What do you hope happens as a result of your report? Do, do you so he, think that state legislatures will read your report and make changes? Absolutely. We, we uh, have a pretty extensive uh, policy recommendation section at the end in which we are trying to get okay. state legislatures to do something before it's too late. We've only got a couple months you know, here before the 2024 elections going to take place. Yeah. We need states to make sure that they do what's necessary to make sure that the vote is free, fair, safe and secure. Uh, real quick, Florida and Georgia did a great job of this right after the 2020 election. Florida in particular passed uh, a bunch of reforms saying, hey, every year we need to make sure that our voter rolls are clean. Hey, we need to make sure that we are encouraging people to vote in person. If you're going to be voting by mail, you should have an excuse, which is the way it should be. We are asking and really hoping that more states jump on board. And it, it really is important that the swing states do this. We're a state-based think tank, so we have you know connections with state lawmakers across the nation. We're doing everything we can to make sure that they make the necessary changes to prevent a 2020 uh, relapse. Yeah, I hope they actually take this seriously, take your recommendations to heart and, and do something about it. We're running out of time. No one questions that. We're, we're down to the wire on securing and, and fixing these problems before before while we can before people go to vote um for you and our audience who want to take a take a look at this very extensive and detailed report and perhaps share it with a lawmaker you might know uh in your state you can go to heartland.org heartland.org thanks so much chris for jumping on with us today this is really important work that you all have done and uh and we're happy to get to share it with our audience hey thank you for bringing it to everybody's attention